Section 7.4 asks us to cover all of the standard algorithms used in traversals with things like arrays and array list. In fact, um, <clears throat> they mention all the algorithms learned in an earlier section, 6.4, things like mean, median, uh, mode, minimum, maximum, shifting, reversing, swapping, all that stuff we did before. So we've seen that previously. It's the same code, different syntax. I'm going to focus instead on these two items here. Now, we've already covered how to delete elements from an array list in our previous lesson, 7.3. So in 7.4, we're going to focus on how to insert elements into a list. Obviously, it's easy to call the add method and just throw something in there. But very often, we want to add and maintain a, a certain order or maybe some other set of criteria. So just based on previous AP questions, I put together a couple of methods I'd like to show you here. And the first one, um, we're going to add numbers into a list. And when we do this, we're told a few things. We're not going to allow any duplicates into the list. So if we see the values already in there, we won't add it. We're going to maintain the ascending order. And I think we're missing a letter there uh, of the list. OK, so return true if that number is added and false otherwise. So in addition to all this, it's a Boolean return. And we're also told that the given list will already be in ascending order. So we're not actually sorting anything. We're going to learn how to do that actually in section six of this unit. Um, so we're given a list of numbers. They're in order from least to greatest. There's no duplicates in there. We get a new number that we want to put into the list. So list of numbers called numbers, new number called num. Let's put num in there. And in doing so, let's not you know upset the order of the list. Um, all right, so there's different ways you can do this. What we're going to do is we're going to loop across in order from left to right. Um, part of the advantage here of writing a left to right loop is that we know we're starting with the smallest number. Although you could make cases to loop in another direction because of how when we add it might cause a shift. Although I don't think it will really affect us much here with this Boolean return. Um, we'll go across numbers once and we're going to visit every single index. Now, one type of loop that we definitely wouldn't want to use here is an enhanced loop. So we learned in section three that if you add or remove from an array list during an enhanced loop, you're going to get a concurrent modification exception. You don't need to know that term. OK. But you do need to know that if you do it, it's going to make a mistake. So you don't want to add or remove from an enhanced loop. All right. Well, we want to maybe first go ahead and just figure out, like, is this number already in there? OK, so if we get a number from this list, is it matching the number that we're trying to put in? Because if it does, it told us pretty clearly that we don't want to do that. And it also said that if you're not going to put the number in the list, go ahead and return false. So at any point, if we encounter the number, we'll just go ahead and return false and shut this down. All right. And then countering that, if our number is less than, and you know, you might wonder like, why did I choose less than not greater than? Well, remember the list is already in sorted order from least to greatest. And since we're starting our loop on the extreme far left, that means that the first iteration of our loop is going to see the smallest number in the list. So right off the bat, if we were smaller than that number, we'd go into the list right in the front. OK, so if like the smallest number in the list is three and I have a two, I'm going to take over the first index. Uh, however, if if I'm not and I go to the next number or the next number, the next number, at some point, if my number that I'm trying to put in becomes smaller than the existing number, it wants to take over that index. And so what we're going to do is we're going to add it to that index, which remember, this is not the set method. The add method means that not only are we going to put that number there, it's going to take over this index that it should hold since it's smaller than the number currently there. It's going to shift over all the other numbers one position. Uh, that's not going to disrupt the order of the list. Everybody's still in relation to each other where they were before. We've just put this new value in because it's smaller than the others. And you don't have to worry and think like, well, what if it should have come sooner? Because if it did, we would have handled that already. But that does pose an interesting question, because how do I know this isn't going to happen again? It actually would happen again if I just left it like this, because the number that I was smaller than just moved to the right, which is exactly where my loop's about to go. 
and I would end up inserting the number again and again and again and again. It would actually become an infinite loop. So the fact that this method said to return a Boolean is actually kind of a, kind of a good thing because it kind of gives me a natural way to break the method down and get out of here. If I go ahead and just return true right at this moment, then it shuts the whole process down. So as soon as I put the number in the list, I'm acknowledging the fact that I don't want to do anything else. So I just get out of here. Remember, if you return from a loop, even if there's iterations left, they won't run those iterations. It's over. Okay. If we reach the end of the loop, so often in Boolean methods, when we reach the end of the loop, we say, oh, let's return true or let's return false. And, you know, that is going to be part of it. We have to end with a return. But technically speaking right now, if I reach the end of the loop, what, what that really means to me is that I didn't make either of these returns. And the collective effect of that is that I never found a match for the number. That's why I never returned false. And I never found a number in the list that my number was smaller than. That's why I never put it in there. There's only one more possibility. If the number was never in the list and it was never smaller than any of the existing values, it must have been bigger than every number in the list. So if we do happen to reach this point, there's only one possibility. Our number needs to go to the very end of the list. Now it's there. Okay. Remember, if you don't specify what index you want to add it to, it automatically goes to the end of the list. And then we'll go ahead and return true, okay? Because anytime we write a Boolean return method, it has to end in a, in a return. I did mention in class how you don't have to do this, but this add method that I just use is unlike the other add method in its return type. This add method is a void return. This one, when you don't give an index, returns true which is a really weird thing. It never returns false. It just always returns true every time you call it. So we could put that into our return and end up giving true this way. You don't have to do that. If I had left it like I did before, it still would have worked just fine. Um, if you look at how I ran this through the main method, I guess gave it a bunch of random numbers, okay? I gave it 20 random numbers, all ranging from one to eight. The list was originally empty. So the first number in actually took advantage of what we see right here because the list was empty. The loop never ran. So for me, I got a three and that three just threw in right at the end and it said true. Okay. This is just pure chance. I happened to get another three on the second run of the loop. Notice that I got false. That couldn't go in. Then I got a seven. Then I got another three and then I got a five and I got another three. He got a lot of threes. Okay. A six and a four. At this point, you know, we can see the three, the four, the five, the six, and the seven, they've all gone into the correct places, okay? And the repeats, they weren't allowed in. Uh, we get some other repeats like the six and the five later. Eventually, you'll probably get all the numbers, you know, but not guaranteed. So I got all the numbers one through eight, okay? All right, so that was my first method I wanted to show you, maintaining order using integers. Here's another example. Okay, and this one, I've changed it up a little. The array list now holds student references. That's going to be a little bit trickier. Uh, it's not as easy as perhaps just working with a number like an integer. There's no duplicates in this list. So this list is sorted by a student's ID number. Okay, pretty much regardless of what school you're at, there's probably never going to be two kids with the same ID number. So we're just going to make the assumption that there aren't any duplicates. So that makes it a little bit easier. This list is sorted also in ascending order, least to greatest by ID number. Okay. Now students have ID numbers, but students are not ID numbers. So I can't compare a student to an ID number, but I can get an ID number from a student and then compare that to another ID number from a student. Okay. Like an int versus an int. You can't compare students because they're not comparable. We'll learn more about that later in unit nine, but for an object to be comparable, it has to implement the comparable interface, which I don't see right here. So it's not doing that. So these aren't actually comparable objects, but you can get their ID number, which is an integer, and then you can make a comparison from there. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. 
Now, the third trick to this is that it's void. That actually makes this a little more challenging. All right, let's say we wrote the same loop. And it, and it is, it's, it's the same loop. We'll just go ahead and walk across all the indexes from left to right, um, taking one at a time. This time the array list was called stews. All right, so we just make a little change there. There's no duplicates, so I'm not gonna bother with this check, okay? I'm gonna pick up right here. So there's my if statement essentially, right? With an add method, and I'm not gonna make a return. But this if statement's a little bit different. I can't take the stew and ask if they're less than stews.get i and then try to insert it. Let me just show you what I'm what I'm kind of thinking here, like my logic, at least to this point. I'm trying to kind of recreate what I saw, you know, right here. You know, take the inserting item, compare it to what's there add it if it's smaller than. So I was trying to like write basically that same thing with, you know, using stew instead of num, stews instead of stew instead of numbers. The difference is these are integers. I can ask Java what's bigger, seven or eight, three or five, six or 10. And Java knows how to answer me, okay? It, it understands how to compare numbers. I can't ask Java who's a bigger student. How am I comparing them? Am I asking who's taller, who weighs more, who's older, who has a higher GPA? You know, what are we talking about? What grade are they in? There's so many ways that you could compare students. And Java doesn't know how. And Java is not smart enough to assume that I want to sort by ID number. So it doesn't, it doesn't know what to do. And it would basically tell me that in an error message. It's going to tell me like, hey, I don't, I don't know what to do. Uh, and so it says right here, bad operand types. That's, it's basically, it's trying to tell me like, it didn't know how to compare that. It didn't know how to treat that less than character for these types of objects, okay? But students have ID numbers, okay? And I think if you, I better go check the syntax, but I'm pretty sure it said get ID number with capitals like that. Yeah, okay. So that method right there, if I apply that method to a student and I'm going to apply it to both of my students, okay, the one that came from the array list, the one that was handed to the method, you can do that. Those are integers. That's a number. Java knows how to compare numbers. So it can do this. Now there's a couple of catches. Okay. So uh, first of all, I'm going to turn on the tester. Okay. Before I forget. And then let's go back and look at that integer one first. Okay, so we are going to put something like this in there again. Um, however, I'm not going to return it because it's not a Boolean return. And I'm not going to write return true because, again, this is a voided method. So I'm not going to return true. I'm not going to return this. But it's the same concept if I reach the end of the loop and I haven't put the student into the list yet, then they must need to go to that last index. So that still holds true, okay? But right now, if I ran this, I'd actually get an infinite loop. It's gonna show up a little differently. Previously, I think whenever we've seen infinite loops, they've probably been like an infinite number of prints. Uh, this won't result in an infinite number of prints. You may have noticed it kind of paused right here for half a second, and now it says out of memory. What happened was, was when we put that student into our list, the student that used to be there moved over one index. Well, we went and revisited them again, and we were still having a less ID number. In this case, it was 2555. It inserted itself into the index held by 2698. And then when 2698 moved over one, 255 cut right in front of it again, and then again, and then again, and then again. And we ended up with an infinite number of 2555 ID number students in our list just over and over and over. We don't want that to happen. Well, what I can't do, and this is how I fixed it last time, was right here, I said, all right, by returning true, that's kind of my ticket out of here, okay? And then that's what shut the method down, even if there was loop iterations remaining. So as a result, I didn't end up putting that student in more than once. That can't be my fix here because this method is void of any return. Okay, we can return though. 
return in a Java sense, just like it kind of means in English, it's just like go back where you came from. So we can instruct the computer to return to where it came from, like where this method call was invoked, which for us is down here. Okay. When you click run, you're running the main method. At some point, we invoked this method call. So we didn't proceed immediately to the line below it. Instead, we went to that method and started to run it. If we encounter a word return, even if the loop isn't finished, we're going to leave this little block of code and go back to where we came from, which was where that method got called. However, since it's void, I cannot return to that line with a value. Okay. So I can't return to here with a true and like insert it into the code at that point. I couldn't return with uh, a number either or anything else. I can't return with a student, but I can return to there. I just can't bring something with me. So in a return method, you return a value and our Boolean return, we returned to where we came from and we brought a value with us, either true or false. In this method, I can return to where I came from. I just can't bring a value with me. I could write the word return here in fact, you could write the word return at the end of every void method, but Java doesn't require you to because it's just seen as like being redundant. You know, you don't, you don't need to write redundant code. When you hit the closing brace of a void method, you're ending the method. It's over. Like writing return just before that is just seen as kind of being silly. So that's why voided methods don't have to close with a return. However, they can return from within if you're looking to disrupt the flow of the method, which is what we're doing here. We're looking to shut it down before it needs to be shut down. And uh, so, yeah, now we've got it just fine. You might read in another textbook about the word break, which you notice turns blue. And that is a keyword in Java and it breaks the loop. In this case, it wouldn't break the method. It would just break out of the loop. And as a result, I'd actually, if I ended, if I put a student in the middle of the list, like 2555 did, unfortunately for me, they'd actually end up inserting themselves to the end of the list then also, because when I break free from the loop, I would end up running this piece right here. So if I used break, I'd still have to go a little further and put in some sort of maybe like Boolean tracker that doesn't allow that piece to get entered more than once. Okay. So there's, like I said, you might read about that somewhere else. That's not technically part of the Java subset. We're, so we're going to use return. For one, it, it's better served to this purpose. It's, it's, it's doing exactly what we want it to. And, and plus, this is in the AP subset. I try to stay in the AP subset with what I teach you. Okay, so this is where we really want to be. All right. And... Yeah, everything looks good. You won't see any duplicates in there and uh, everybody's in order.